And uh, the session today is gonna be about meeting our fellows. Just to quickly summarize, our fellowship scheme uh, aims to support GoGN alumni and members in the last step of their PhD. This round of fellowships will last from uh, October until March next year, and we'll see uh, explanations and areas to cover activities that will include uh, undertake a, a piece of research around OER, OE, OEP, uh, as well uh, development of OER activities in our region, and as well particular focus on uh, fostering connections with other networks uh, through identification of events and having attending conferences or online events and recruitment of new members for the network. Some of the outputs that will include these fellowships are reports back to the network, blog posts in, in uh, the GoGN website, so uh, keep uh, a look there, and as well we'll get report at the end of the fellowship. So uh, big applause, here we have our uh, four fellows for this year, Joe, Judith, Chrissy, and Virginia. And uh, now they are going to have some time to introduce uh, their uh, fellowships and what they are planning to do. So uh, congratulations, first of all. We are starting, uh, well, the, the schema is that we are going to have around 15 minutes for presentation and uh, some time for questions after all and some time at the end, luckily, although we're a bit behind the schedule. So, um, Joe, just start. Welcome. Hey, thanks, everyone. Uh, just push my little timer. I've got some gas to training, so hopefully I'll be uh, not not uh, not short of that. Um, OK, so my name is Johanna Funk. Um, I'm from the College of Indigenous Features, Arts and Society here at Charles Darwin University. And my fellowship will be looking at open education practices in cultural capability learning and higher education. So the next slide, I go like this. Okay, All right. I remember now. Uh, so first, I'd like to recognize the traditional owners of the land on which I'm greeting you from. I'm here on Larrakia country in the top end of Australia. Um, I'm also aware that many of you are joining us from unceded lands, so I want to acknowledge elders past, present, and future um, everywhere joining us there tonight. Um, and also to set the tone and the intention of the significance of the contribution of the senior authorities that have directed a lot of the work that um, we're talking about tonight. So a little bit of context uh, and some issues that have been affecting the work here. Everyone usually sees the total map of Australia and concentrates on the bottom bits because that's where all the big bougie cities are. Um, but I'm up here in the top end in Darwin, closer to Indonesia and Timor-Leste uh, than the rest of the country. Um, just this past week, we've had a bill go through the Senate and it's likely to be passed, uh, affecting the federal funding um, allocations for higher education courses. Um, making teaching nursing sciences uh, half the price um, they were and doubling the cost of any humanities degrees. This, of course, is going to affect us in the humanities and the College of Indigenous Futures, um, even though we have a very forgiving hex debt system. Uh, we also have a very a big job readiness focus from high school up through uh, university. Uh, so that obviously is backing the kind of the guaranteed idea that we're, people are going to get a work in these uh, in these sectors. Um, Charles Darwin University has been around since the 70s, where it started as a community college. Um, main campuses are in Darwin and Alice Springs. We're dual sector, which means trades and higher education on the same campuses. Uh, and 70% of our students are online. In 2017, uh, we also went through a faculty to college structure restructure, uh, during which not an insignificant amount of jobs went through a restructuring process. And now with the federal budget being what it is, uh, affecting the other things that were leading to previous restructures, we're now going through the second one that's been announced just in the last uh, two weeks. We have 20,000 students. 14% of which are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identifying. Uh, we're aiming for 20, that's the national target. 
14% of our students are international. So that's a bit better and off, makes us a little luckier than some of the students or schools down south that really rely on that international student market. And it also, uh, the reason I'm including these ideas is that it affects kind of the climate and the culture in which we're, we're trying to help students understand the cultural implications of their degrees and how they can interact within those disciplines. So my fellowship is a review of the cultural capability unit that we teach and that I'm uh, very active in. It's a 100 level unit that's blended with a 200 uh, cohort and about 2,000 students per year go through this unit um, and we call it unit here it's a you know 12 week um, semester but the unit is the, the actual class um, so all the schools in or all the disciplines across the university take part um, in the unit itself and so that has a lot of implications for students having an idea of how this made makes a difference to me especially in first year uh, of course, teachers and social workers and nurses have a bit closer of an idea, um, but it also varies with people's expectations about their technical uh, and professional qualifications and where the boundaries are around that and the ability of cultural un understandings to be able to do those jobs effectively and well across different uh, knowledge systems. So we renovated the curriculum when we restructured and we inherited this great unit. Um, and obviously centralized and privileged the indigenous relationality um, uh, learning. So some examples of how we're open to that. Um, I, you may have seen some of these slides before. I'll just whip through a couple of examples of how our senior lecturers, uh, NOLA lecturers, completed and developed this framework for cultural performance and how you actually process and perform your culture. It's not just a thing that happens in one place and has walls around it, it's a way of life and being and doing and knowing. They also provided these lovely little mini lectures that just keep giving and um, when looking at them, I realized that these are ways that you operate effectively and, and appropriately in different cultural contexts, but it's also ways that you work effectively and appropriately in different contexts. So it started to make a lot of sense to me how um, being culturally capable in these ways also makes you incredibly employable and able to work across different knowledge systems. So we start with that and then we also create a space on this learning management system that isn't open, but we try and make it as open to students as possible and they claim it for themselves. They do a lot of draft peer feedback and co-creation of the assignments together. Um, and then we also did some polling um, with the pivot to online, it wasn't so much of a pivot for us because everything was online to begin with and a, a small percentage of the students just showed up personally in class. Most everyone had access and um, had to do their work online. So we developed some consensus and non-time management tools to students via this poll of how they wanted the blend of synchronous and asynchronous delivery uh, through those three hours of contact time during the week. And finally, we applied these principles that we learn over the semester to real life, uh, politically contentious and culturally contentious issues such as um, anti-Aboriginal and anti-Asian discrimination in, within Australia, as well as um, uranium mining on, on Indigenous country. Finally, they get to contribute their work from these assignments to our CDU press book. Uh, that we just got uh, off the ground this semester and so um, students work uh, they volunteer at this point to to, to share their work and um, whether or not they want their name on it is up to them we edit it together in a google doc if they want to edit it but i've given them the opportunity to separate the performance within the unit to sharing your knowledge outside the unit to making your work that much more uh, indisposable so with those examples in mind i thought i thought how can we actually do um, and see open education practice and cultural knowledge at this time in the world? I mean, it's been a bit of a, of a year, culturally speaking, for a lot of reasons, and it continues to be. So with those uh, practices in mind, those, those open practices I just showed you kind of allow us to perform our technical and professional skills in a unique way that contribute more to the community 
and build bridges um, with some agency, um, whereas it's it's less formalized and more kind of proactive way of working. Um, you can, can apply the five R's, as it were, the sharing, reuse, retention, revision, remixing, and redistribution to ways we learn and work openly across communities, cultures, and colleges, and offices and knowledge sectors. And much with indigenous knowledge systems, we have to adapt openness for use in conventionally or traditionally more closed or restrictive systems. Um, we've got a lot of ways that knowledge is managed, especially in securities and intelligence and biosecurity and things like that, but also within the LMS and the university IP and copyright um, structures in Australia too, as well as everywhere else. Um, so we can adapt openness for use within those systems and if we're not working in a completely open one. We can weave OEP into curriculum and learning design to impact across the university, but also to share with other universities who might want to try their own way of doing this and incorporate OEP with uh, culturally appropriate workforce and civic learning. So again, getting back to that fact that, yes, you'll leave with a degree in, in engineering, but if you've been exposed to different ways of thinking and talking and different ways of managing resources in an open way and collaborating with your classmates, then you're going to be miles ahead if you've, if you've had access to open policy frameworks and these types of things. And you've already, you've already got those professional skills that you started in first year. These all came out of my... PhD uh, research. I get to I get to cite as Funk 2020, which is really funny to me. But um, use all forms of language to develop consent and dialogue. Um, we have a situated kind of practice and praxis for the processes of how we do and learn and work together um, in places that are significant to where we're doing that work. So what's going to work in one place obviously is going to be adapted for another. And that content, um, context-based knowledge and language use and understanding that an engineer is going to think of design very differently to an artist. And so understanding how we use language and in certain contexts opens up the possibility to work interculturally with all these wonderful digital skills that we've been practicing and really transforms that expectation that language and learning is going to be provided to me and I can then use that learning management system to manage my own learning and offer my um, offer my my knowledge as a student so uh, I think that's the right one yes <laughs> so the, the the elements I'm going to use to do this um, is to make sure that um, I make the time. Um, in finding out the relevance of these cultural capabilities and the openness that uh, the open practices that can really benefit each student is thinking about the graduate attributes that we have to meet in our strategies, the digital information literacies and scholarship, uh, using the um, analytics and student evaluations and peer review ethically, and I'm about to enter the ethics process for a little bit more than just the generic info that I want to use. Um, James from California and University of Cape Town and of course Quality Matters all have ideas about how to present content. Uh, so that's a significant but not central idea to this idea of open practices that we're looking at. Most of all um, these workforce competencies the Australian government and employment departments have developed as well as Lots of other reports from PricewaterhouseCoopers about future skills and these types of things and how we can map across to the wonderful open practices that, um, that we're looking for. So, moving right along, the timeline starts now uh, where we're developing the criteria and the cycle and begin that. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can blog and blog. Um, I'll see what, what comes off my my tongue naturally, um, and whether or not I could just type that up, but I think talking is really a nice way. Ethics obviously continue going through. We've just wrapped up week 12 of the semester, so we're about to start another semester on November the 9th, which will end in February. So uh, I've got another semester's worth, but if I can't use this semester's my view, I can always try next. 
Um, so continue the cycle and go in these kind of iterations and um, work through it um, until February, March next year, where I can then um, do the final report. Finally, we've got um, the network and how we can use the OGN's reach to help students understand the implications of openness for them. We obviously have a lot of education students in that 2000 number every year. Uh, we have a lot of education students in, uh, at CBU, but we also have a remote Aboriginal teacher education program. So the kind of culturally sensitive openness that we're talking about would sit um, hopefully quite well uh, with, those, with those students. We also have a, a, a starting up a lovely tradition of open platform sharing with different design labs within our college itself. We've got the fine arts students and during the COVID pivot, uh, discovered you know that a lot of different ways they can share their photo essays and stuff like that um, on their art lab platform. So we've got more than just that little press book that we started. Um, education strategy and the executive are really, really behind um, this, this idea of openness. They've developed an open strategy with use of all different media. And we also have the Australian OEP SIG, the wonderful ALT, and the Canadian OTESA network. So lots of different networks to share the goods with as we go along. Um, and um, I would love to have any ideas or questions. Um, you can uh, hit me up here and I'm going to work on my publications. Ooh, here we go. That's my Twitter handle and my email. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Joe, and for your presentation. Uh, very clear. It's time for uh, some conversation with uh, with Joe and uh, questions. Thanks, Penny. Nice to see you. I know it's ambitious, Chrissy. <laughs> Um, I've got an assistant, thanks Jenny, um, assistant dean of learning futures and the, um, the dean of the college, Ruth, is um, very much behind this. It's a great way to showcase the good work that students are generating, but also, you know, how we, um, how we can share, like, the, the understanding of Different ways of doing things. I think the the culture and the the, the the federal and the and the university level kind of you know the pressures that are on us all. I think you know that we're all feeling a little bit stressed. And um, the way that we've developed a few of the other units alongside this one has been um, very different from the conventional way of doing things. Open development, as you saw with Yoma lecturers and guest speakers and these types of things. So it's it's getting away from this is my unit to a more horizontal um, collaborative management of learning in the college. So yeah, a little ambitious. Everyone's using that word, so that's got me a little bit freaked out that I'm trying to do too much, and that's usually my problem. <laughs> um, so good question, Jenny. Um, those are my more senior colleagues. My um, uh, a lot of other colleagues that like to work that way are obviously really on board um, and have seen that this has worked and it's like, oh, this stuff kind of almost teaches itself. It's like, yeah, the students really like to have a little bit of control there. So um, Martin's question about if it all went perfectly, what the impact would be. Hopefully students feeling like um, they're really prepared and that they have some agency. A lot of the students um, that are especially coming from abroad um, and of course that are a lot of our students are, are first in family students they don't have that tradition in their families of going to university so for them um, I've already you know kind of informally they've written in their assignments that they they feel like they can control their own learning that they never really had to, to write assignments or develop you know reflective pieces like the work that we assign. They've only ever written exams, um, but they can really see how they um, how they can rely on themselves and be confident and direct their own learning and manage their own time. 
and I had students at the last lecture in the, of, the, of the semester yesterday say, thank you, you made us think really deeply, and that's, you know, that was really helpful this semester. And, you know, we've had students in lockdown in Melbourne, like, all semester, and they were clocking in every single week, and I was really thankful for that, too. So, um, I feel like it's that relation, relational learning, relationship building, that establishes a kind of collaborative idea that the impact can be that they can do that job, their job in that way, maybe when they get out and start building bridges and tending to sick people and teaching young people. I hope that answers your question, Martin. Important <laughs> question indeed. And uh, Chris is asking about uh, what problem challenges do you uh, foresee with your project? I think I try to do too much. <laughs> always, I always try to do too much. So the list of elements for my developmental evaluation um, is, uh, um, yeah, it's a very ambitious list, but I think what I've done is I've kind of, it's like I kind of cram as much as I can into my dilly bag. And then um, again, I just kind of choose the best bits of the first round I, I sweep through with. And, and I continue to dig a bit deeper with each of those. So um, it's an iterative process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, for your presentation. Thank uh, you. Wh what time is it where you are not in uh, Darwin? It's 9 p.m. now. Okay, that's something uh, really nice as well. We got uh, four fellows from four different continents, and yeah. we, have, <laughs> we have quite uh, diverse uh, time zones today, which is great. Seems to be working. So, Judith, you can now proceed to present your fellowship. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good night uh, to everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today and uh, to present uh, uh, my, my fellowship. I'm so happy about it. I'm so humble about it. And I think I'm the most happiest woman in the global south today. <laughs> now, um, I, I will go through my slides. And uh, Paco, are you the one pushing uh, or I do it as well? You can either use the arrows on the top down or just click over the slides or I can uh, move them for you if you want to. Okay, good. Let's see. Okay, good. And now, uh, my name is Judith Pete, and I'm currently engaged at Tangaza University College, where I teach. Uh, I'm a lecturer, and as a lecturer, I'm expected to teach and uh, promote learning among the, the students and those who are learning with us. I also supervise uh, students uh, at master's level and BA level. And I'm also uh, a research uh, chair for a committee for research in the university. And uh, apart from that, uh, I'm also engaged in a number of uh, things within the community to at least to ensure that the social aspect of my life and my career is also felt in my community. I'm really an ambassador and I push forth and springboard issues pertaining girl child education. And currently we have a lot of issues to, I mean, to, to mend as a result of the COVID-19 where now we have teenage pregnancies like the order of the day. And then I'm also a mentor. I move from school to school when, when I'm on holiday to help those who need my, my support. Then, um, uh, this fellowship in the context really, it came up probably I think at the right time when I'd just signed in a new contract with my university with regards to being the regional African regional hub, regional coordinator uh, with regards to service learning. Service learning is all about linking theory, practice and faith uh, in, in the essence of uh, experiencing holistic social transformation. So with this particular uh, uh, new contract, uh, and uh, I realized that it's a program, it's a global program that was, happen that was happening through the hubs, the seven hubs 
uh, in, in the global region. So I realized that in the African region, we shall be having at least 20 universities. And uh, in among these 20 universities, I was thinking, now what exactly can I do for the for GN? And being a pioneer member of this network, I feel obliged that I have to do something for the network. And also having understood the charisma, the charism of the network founder, who is Professor, the late Professor uh, Fred Mulder, I felt I need to do something. That was his really desire for the Global South. So I kept pondering on how actually to give this an approach. Then eventually fellowship came up. Now, my desire to act as an ambassador for the network in the Global South, therefore, has sprung up the idea of applying for this fellowship uh, in the sense that how can I be an advocate for the network? Two, how can I recruit more members to join the network? And you know, uh, this particular network, as a pioneer member, I have learned that uh, I would, uh, it is a network that aims towards raising the profile of all the open action researchers. And I'm one of them who I want to believe. And I know that my profile has been really raised through this network. And two, supporting the PhD students. I was one of the candidates and students through, all through. And through this network, I was able now, and I can call myself proudly as a doctor because of the network. And thirdly, I believe that another aim of this particular network is to give or to engage the alumni the same way now I'm getting engaged. I am exactly one year since I graduated with my, with, with my PhD. But I think I've done so much and I've, I've learned so much still within the network and yet I have graduated. So the alumni engagement is really a drive that should draw other people to join the network. So, and lastly, developing the entire openness, uh, which is therefore a process of open research. So how can I therefore raise this or use these gains at the aims of the, uh, of the network to ensure that we have more recruits too, to ensure that we also bring in some other supervisors from the Global South to join in supporting the PhD candidates globally. So this basically, I see it as a call that I want to do something. So I, penned, I, 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 I expressed this impression that I want to be a champion in improving the quality of education. But how about if I use this opportunity as the regional coordinator for this particular project and then link it up? As I, miss, as I meet researchers, I meet students, I'll be able to meet you know, top-notch uh, uh, leaders in these institutions. How, how therefore can I use this opportunity to also raise the profile of the e of, of Gojira as a network? And this will basically help me heal from my desire to do something for the network. Then, just a little a brief of, of, of how I'm going to balance these two and how related I see a lot of integration and relationship between the service learning project, which is a global program that works through seven hubs in the global, uh, I mean, in, in, in the world. And I realized that uh, uh, through this particular pro project and the program, the 20 universities are all in higher education. So they call the Catholic higher education institutions. And the GM focus is also on higher education. How can we improve through OER, OEP, uh, the quality of education? the quality of research, open researches, such that uh, we, we, we enhance and use these researches uh, uh, anywhere at any time to transform, transform educational systems. So uh, through the Unisabitate program, this global initiative within the seven hubs, I am very confident that I'll be able to move the profile of Godian. That means I'm going to let Godian be known beyond what, where, where we are now. And two, I will also use the same platform to ensure that I reach out to more new, new candidates that would also join the program and then get their profiles lifted and their PhDs, promote the entire process of openness in researches, and also grow the network, which is my desire. So this is a regional hub, but this is also within the global south. How can we also bring in some of the supervisors who can also support the network in terms of supervision, in terms of mentorship, and in terms also of undertaking certain relevant researches that will also promote openness in the region. Now, how am I planning to do this? 
Now, uh, I'm thinking of going or using the first 20 uh, universities within Africa, where I know I'm going to interact with students. Some of them will be PhD students. Then evaluating and with a good profile developed for, by the regional team uh, within the GoGN, use the rightful information to market GoGN among the students, among the supervisors, and among the researchers. So we strengthen this network through such kind of uh, interaction and collaborations. That is my dream number one. The other thing I'm planning to do is uh, actually the process is already on. I know tomorrow we shall be having uh, our regional symposium of uh, recruiting, recruiting or inaugurating new members to the network. And in this symposium, there are, I'll also be able to meet the various rectors and university vice chancellors. And then we shall be able, able to talk about and channeling the various activities between now until March, which is the end of the first financial year for this project. So I have a feeling that even if we don't have the face-to-face -face interactions currently as a result of the COVID-19, but then through the uh, online uh, and the online interactions, still I believe I can still use that to let my dream fail. Now, I also need a good professional profile for our network that we can use out there so that we don't get into certain challenges like, uh, you know, uh, people having an idea that GoGN funds PhDs, which is not the case. And sometimes when you share with people such kind of a be ambitious networks, the first thing is, how can I get money to pay for my what? My PhD. And that is not really the intention of, 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 of GoGN. GoGN raises profiles, it supports you in the entire process. It also gives you the, I mean, the needful platform to share your worries, to share your joy and all that expertise before you actually finish up your studies and graduate. So, the underlying barriers in the recruitment is what one of them have mentioned that sometimes people misunderstand the vision and the mission. So we need that beautiful profile developed that can really help in selling and recruiting new members to, uh, to, to, our, uh, to, to, to the network. Now, how will I do this, the time frame? Now, August uh, 2020, which is this year, we did have uh, the constitution of the hubs. The seven hubs are already there. Then um, in October 15, which is tomorrow, we shall have the selection process of these universities in place. And then in October 29, that is, then we, have, we shall have an inaugural uh, symposium that is going therefore to ensure that the membership is formed, they are part and parcel of the, of the team, and then the journey starts. Then in between November uh, 11th, the hub seminar will be uh, of all the new partners. We will be able to have them. And then from there until the end of March, we shall have capacity building of which some of them already uh, have confirmed will be on face-to-face -face basis, hoping that the pandemic reduces and the pandemic actually has also brought down a number of plans that people have in place. And therefore, I pray that you join me in this ambitious journey, ambitious dream, I'm out for it. And really, I want to ensure that our network is known. Our profile is well represented. Using my own example uh, on what I have actually uh, undergone through this network will and should actually inspire others to join, inspire the supervisors to join, inspire more research so that we really build a strong network that has a continuity that is also raising the charism and that which the founder had in mind. Thank you, friends, and I look forward for your support. Asante. Thank you so much for this uh, loving that emphasis. And it's, it's time now for some uh, questions and interact with uh, Judith and uh, her fellow uh, proposal.
trying to look at the equations. Yeah. Um, ah, okay, okay, I can see. Uh, do I have helpers as well? Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, you cannot do some of these things alone. I will be journeying with the regional office. Uh, that is, I'm, um, I'm banking of uh, Martin Paco back, <laughs> especially in terms of coming up with the proper profile that can be shared out uh, properly. I lead the secretariat as the regional coordinator, and therefore I have a team behind me here. We are around six people within the same university. And of course, in each and every university, we have focal point person, professors who will help us to reach out to more members and also plan for activities together. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think uh, uh, yeah, Chris is asking a, a similar question. Uh, mm -hmm. Will you work with a team? Mm -hmm. And um, Ada, this is an important one. How many people are you expecting to reach and involve with your project? Yes, uh, now uh, in terms of, I have a target that I want to meet between now and March, if possible. I am targeting at around eight. And if badly off, I want to land on five. But then this is a continuous process. This project is ideally 10 years. So I would really want to give myself that particular rate that in the first uh, financial year, year one, at least five for the lower side. Then we're moving with the time. Then we see how best we can increase, uh, move, uh, increase that number to a level whereby we can really have more members joining our wonderful network. I can see Leo and other typing. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you will run some webinars. So were you thinking of bringing some of us in those to those? <laughs> yes, Leo, I will not leave you behind. <laughs> yes, you know, this is a network. It is a collaboration. It is a partnership. And we have friends of the network as well. You know, if you want to achieve something, unity is strength. I will love people to journey with me. That's the same way as people who have been journeying with me all along until my graduation. I will also love to reciprocate the same by working as a team and ensuring that really something is done for our network. Yes, the project is for the next 10 years. So thank you very much, Judith, for uh, your presentation. And uh, now we are moving on to Chris's. Uh, Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank Hello. Hello. Welcome, Chrissy. Oh, so God. it's your time <laughs> to present your fellowship. Yes. Lovely. Thank you so much. I was so worried that it wouldn't work now, but uh, good to be here. Thank you so much for, um, for awarding me one of the four fellowships. It was fascinating to hear Joe and uh, Judy so far. They are very ambitious. We are just going to create a picture book. <laughs> I am afraid, um, but so it is a project uh, about uh, creating a collaborative uh, openly licensed picture book around open uh, education and I'm not alone here. I'm just the coordinator. If you like, I have a whole team. Uh, we are eight in total, including myself, which is not quite a football team, if you like. <laughs> But uh, we are maybe a handball team, seven plus uh, a coach. So I have with me here Gino, Helen, uh, Verena, Penny, Paula, Evie, Odie, uh, and all of you, if you would like uh, to, to help us as well. Right, how do I move forward now? Okay, I managed. Here's a task for you. If you have worked with me, you know me, I want to keep it a bit alive and interactive. Also, all your questions, if you can articulate them as we go through, that would be lovely and maybe also save us time in the end. And Paco will, uh, I'm sure, help us to um, facilitate the, the answers as well. So here's a task for you. Um, we all lo uh, love our penguin. Here he is, but this is a picture book and we have no idea what's going to come out of it. But the task is on the slides throughout the presentation, you will see these uh, ladybugs uh, coming along. We would like you to, um, to count them, not these ones, forget about these ones, there are far too many, <laughs> uh, to count them during the presentation. And then uh, I will tell you in the end what's going to happen with the winner who gets the number 
Right, okay, not these ones. This is just a warning. And there will be not that many on each slide. So I hope you will be able to focus uh, on the project itself while you're also counting. Okay, I hope you enjoy it. I thought 29. <laughs> Leo, please don't count the any of these ones. Um, it starts from the next page. And here we go. Okay, so picture books. Um, just about the story first. What is story? Storytelling uh, is really important. We grow up with stories, but as we grow older, we forget about how we can use them for learning and teaching, uh, if you like. Uh, and um, remembering that we need story in our lives is really important. Uh, Jenny Moon actually talks here about we need a story more than we need truth. But what I would also like to say is we also need uh, truth uh, in stories. Um, linking that to uh, to pictures, uh, and uh, they do have political power, and they evoke very strong uh, emotions. And we are immersed today in a in a world of of pictures. Uh, we create our own. We're all creators, but also um, consumers. I don't like the word, but we are consuming uh, ongoingly uh, pictures and, and what we see around us. So how can we uh, utilize um, these? And uh, going now into picture books, where we combine uh, the visual world with uh, written language. Uh, picture books, as we know, and we all, if we have children or um, nieces or, or friends who have children, we have uh, seen that um, we read uh, picture books often for uh, young children who actually can't read. And that is fascinating. We are also the, the buyers uh, of these books often, but they are very strong in uh, triggering emotional um, engagement. And I very recently shared one with um, with my colleagues I'm going to work with on this project. Uh, and I think Penny uh, was one of them who realized that how, how strong that can actually be. So they are uh, tools that can empower children in all kinds of different ways but beyond that that they are written often uh, for young children three to five uh, primarily um, they are cross-generational and i think if an adult reads a, a children's book and doesn't get uh, engaged doesn't get anything out of it uh, there is no point so they are cross-generational and they are increasingly uh, picture books created also um, for adults and to that um, text that we have, the pictures obviously create an extension of that story and um, let the imagination go uh, wild and in all kinds of different directions. And that is the beauty when you then also work um, with an illustrator. Uh, often also we have um, authors who, uh, who are illustrators as well, but uh, we are turning all this uh, on its uh, head. So our research question, uh, Rob challenged me <laughs> in an interview earlier. So what is your research question? I thought, okay, let's think about this. And uh, voila, here is one. So what is the impact? What we are trying to find out is what is the impact of um, this open picture book that doesn't exist yet? Uh, we have no clue yet what's going to be in it. Um, how will this be able to raise awareness about open education? And when we talk about open education, often, we talk about open education in the context of higher education. Uh, remember to count the ladybirds. <laughs> um, we talk often about higher education, yeah, but actually uh, it, it should start much, much earlier. And um, why why not try that to the medium of, uh, of picture books? So this is what uh, the basic idea behind it, if that works. And if you remember, they are cross-generational as well. So can that work to raise awareness between our youngest, uh, our, our future uh, open educators and open um, and leaders in this society uh, and um, the more older ones like us, I guess. <laughs> So this is an idea that I have explored for a number of years, and uh, there are two projects that I have successfully uh, completed with others always. <laughs> and this is one here about refugees. I authored uh, and worked with, with a colleague. I haven't actually told you where I work and what I do, but I'll say that at the end if you're interested. So this is a book about uh, refugees. It's an open book that uh, has been published on Storyweaver, an open platform for picture books, specifically um, based in um, 
in India. You have to have a look at this. It's fantastic. Um, the, the plethora of, of stories and uh, the commitment and the generosity uh, people have shown to contribute to this. And many of these are translated in, in many, many different uh, languages. Um, the next project, remember the ladybirds, the next project was very recent during the, <laughs> during the pandemic. Uh, and that was a collaboration of one writer. It was uh, me, I wrote the story, plus multiple uh, illustrators. Uh, we worked on this project and it is The Invisible King. Um, um, again, it's openly uh, available. Have a look and read and, and see if that uh, uh, makes sense to you. But again, it was a project that helped us uh, do something creative during the pandemic and something uh, very, very different with these um, students at Manchester Met where I work. <laughs> okay, so coming to uh, the plans for for this project, the fellowship project, what will it be? No idea. What I do know is that it would be useful to, since um, we got funding for that, to create a book, uh, a picture book about open education, how that will feel, how that will look like, uh, we don't know yet. But we thank uh, uh, Gojian for their generosity. So yes, uh, going back, Remember the ladybirds? <laughs> there will be now multiple writers. This is something that I haven't done before in a creative writing context. We often do that uh, in academic writing, but uh, in um, in creative writing, in, in writing literature, this is actually not very common. Um, I do remember that there is a book dash, book dash in South Africa who have uh, writing sprints where they do work uh, collaboratively in team, uh, teams to produce picture books, but I haven't seen it uh, anywhere else. So um, this will be about open education, but this time we will have um, one illustrator only and one designer who's going to put the book together. So this is just a reminder here, writing is gardening. I love that quote and I'll give you one minute to read it. So as you can see, it compares writing with gardening. And I, I think it's, it's beautifully said, but also sometimes we have ideas in our head and we think, oh, I have a plan. I know where I'm going. I know where the story is going to lead me. But this is not the case. When we start writing, and I have experiences myself, uh, at least in creative writing, where you have that freedom um, to do that, um, that the story and its characters take you on a journey themselves. And um, there is no way you can control these characters. The characters control you. Now, it talks here about gardeners, and we will be gardeners. Like I said, we are a team. Uh, how that is going to work, I have no idea. But count the ladybirds. Right, trying to move on, and now I can't. I don't know why. Marco, I'm unable to move on. I don't know what's happening. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, thank you. So, like we said, uh, like I said earlier, this is a, a project, a collaborative project uh, from the very outset, and the team has been established, and you will get to know them in a tiny bit. So, when you look at the circles here, we see there's a core team that consists of uh, the writers, the six writers, one illustrator and one designer who is actually here with us. Hi, Odi. Um, then we will have um, a survey. We invite the GoGN community and the wider open um, uh, community to contribute seeds for our story through a survey. And I know that uh, Helen, Penny and Paula are here. So if if one of you at least could please share the link now uh, in the chat, that would be really um, very helpful. And this is ready to go. And it's it's fantastic because this is our first milestone, if you like. Uh, I had the draft together in the last few um, days. We had the opportunity as a team um, to, since we all know each other already, <laughs> we didn't have that um, uh, time, uh, if you like, uh, needed to get to know each other. We jumped straight into um, doing work here for for the picture book. So we have been working on 
on finalizing that survey and it was fascinating last night i was going to bed and there i looked uh, at our <laughs> dm and colleagues had deeply engaged with the survey last minute i said we need to finish this by tomorrow we need to take it out so colleagues had written a whole novel um critiquing the um, you know the the survey we have and it's wonderful to see how how the team has actually embraced the project already and it just confirms that um what we talked about the gardeners and looking after things and growing um but not knowing what's going to happen thank you Oh, Paco shared the survey. Thank you so much. So here's the lovely team again, uh, distributed across the world. If you are familiar with the flags, you will know on which continents uh, we all are. So uh, Gino was the first one to respond. So he is uh, at the at uh, the left hand side. But I've also added some comments here, if you like, on the on the left um, when I approached uh, my, my colleagues and and what they said. Uh, I don't think any of them has. Um, done something uh, similar uh, and you can see their um, hesitation but also their commitment <laughs> if you like uh, in participating in this uh, it was good to see that uh, people feel that they can trust me uh, and that they find that this is an exciting project they want to be part of despite uh, perhaps the newness and the novelty of this. So I, I do thank you all from the bottom of my heart, including Evie, who I worked with on a, a previous project, and Odie, who's going for the very first time, put uh, a picture book um, together. Okay, thank you all. Um, please keep counting the ladybirds. <laughs> We're almost there. So the key output is the book uh, and that will be in digital format um, after the the book uh, is ready we would also like to have a, a set of flashcards uh, that can be used um, across the education sector or professional development outside uh, in, in various settings to raise awareness uh, through storytelling about open education, its value um, for communities, but also for society more generally. And we would like to uh, translate also at the same time into key languages using um, obviously uh, people who are knowledgeable about translation as Helen uh, reminded me. <laughs> Very, very recently. So our timeline is we are launching the survey today uh, and Paco kindly shared that here in the chat. So thank you. Um, and this will remain open for um, October. So at the end of the month, we are going to um, close it. And then the hard work begins uh, for all of us writers <laughs> um, to actually uh, make sense of some of this. And like I've said um, yesterday, um, uh, Gino was concerned about some of the questions. I said, this is just one source of information, you know, um, the seeds that we get through the survey. There will be various inspirations that we will take to actually articulate um, a storyline. So in December, when in so in November, we are going to write that story a whole month. Hopefully that will be enough because we are not looking for 80,000 words like a PhD. We are just looking maybe for 500 words. So that should be managed. How hard can it be? Um, but they say, you know, uh, it is actually harder to be concise and do less and have powerful messages in there. So um, I, I'm sure it will be a challenging, but also um, quite exciting at the same time. Uh, in December, we hope uh, Evie will be able to um, take that storyline that we will have create some uh, thumbnails, uh, the storyline in pictures that we can have a look at, see what we think, how, what we would like to change, and then uh, also have our uh, critical readers engage at that process because um, we will still have time to make changes to the story so we would engage um, um, the GoGN community, of course, again, uh, but also um, uh, school children uh, from across the world. And since the team is... Uh, across the world it will be really uh, easy to do i hope okay so the illustrations will be done in uh, january and february and at the same time while we will have fixed uh, the text we could uh, start looking at some of the translations we already uh, have um, two or three here lined up i don't even know if i have asked paula but uh, paula <laughs> is here on the on the slide uh, showing uh, doing the Italian one. We can change that, Paola. Apologies if that um, 
we haven't discussed that. But in March, Odi is going to design the book, take the pictures, the text, and make it look um, really pretty. And in April, we are going to launch uh, the picture book. I think it is ambitious. Um, but from what I know is picture books usually take two years um, to uh, from from the idea to uh, to production so we are going to speed that process up um, i know it can be done uh, we are all committed to this and uh, it is a fantastic opportunities and we will deliver if we get that story <laughs> which is key so again about story and i'm almost at the end count the ladybirds we are almost there now um this this is uh, richard wagamese i don't know if you know him a canadian writer and journalist and he talks here about story the key is we are story it's not just about stories but we are stories and i know that other people have said we are or we are in the same sense we are story okay so just a minute maybe to to read um what it's what uh, Richard says here. So we are a story and we can change the world. Let's see if we can really do that <laughs> with our story. So thank you for for listening uh, i hope that uh, triggered some interest in the in the project and uh, hopefully some of you at least will um, try and be involved and share uh, our survey at this stage further um count the ladybirds how many did you find including uh, on this page All right and i'm going to move on Sorry, <laughs> I revealed, I revealed the right answer. Did anybody find how many you found? Apologies, this is the thing with, with preparing slides, not knowing what comes next. Ada, 70, 27. Okay, good. It, it is 27 and the person who got it, Penny, you are from the team. So if we... Uh, if we say that Ada um, got them, I'll make a note. Uh, you, What you won is you're going to be our very first critical reader. Uh, and I hope um, you will you will be critical because what we don't want at that stage is to say, yeah, that's a great story. <laughs> you know, like when you have uh, your first chapter or your first um, uh, full draft ready of your PhD, this is where you really need uh, critical voices. Great. Ada, is that okay with you? Yes, fantastic. Very good. And this is just a reminder about, well, about our great uh, Gojian family. Like I used to say, Tuka Pomocha, uh, Judith uh, introduced us to this term. And I'm grateful for this community, for existence of this community, because thanks to this, I managed to complete my own PhD in 2017. I can't believe it, so three years ago. Uh, in October, actually, I graduated. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here for me and for being here for each other. And thank you for uh, the GoGN um, organizers and the team behind it. Some references, and I think that's it. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Uh, very uh, inspirational and, and uh, powerful presentation and colorful. Uh, it's great you managed to match uh, the number of ladybirds with my age. So <laughs> it's my age as well, not. <laughs> <laughs> so any any question uh, for Chrissy regarding her uh, fellowship? Kathy says I love the idea uh, though counting the ladies. <laughs> yes. So Thank Jenny. you everybody. It's absolutely fine. If there are no questions, I think we can move on, you know. Um, we are here uh, if anybody would like to find out more. Uh, please get in touch and other we will be in touch with you. <laughs> Jenny has one question, I'm afraid. Okay, while, that's good. Yeah, while cross-generational, do you have any specific audience in mind? What do you mean, about the story or the book itself? I don't understand the question.
Jenny, cross generation. Do you have a specific audience in mind? Yes, like I said, Jenny, uh, I think I understand the question. Um, yeah, that will get yes, it's not going to be a picture book for three to five year olds that don't also speak to teenagers and adults. The um, ambition is that it works for everybody. Often these books work, at the, there are different layers and different age groups get different things out of it. That's why they might look simple but they are not simplistic. There will be, uh, um, it, within the storyline, but also in the pictures, there will be messages, if you like, hidden, that can be discovered by the reader, by the person who looks at uh, the whole book and the stories. Does this answer your question, Jenny? Yes, we will have children readers as well, definitely. That's why we are going to work with um, with schools, with primary school teachers as well. But the key is, yes, not just to appeal to adults, um, but also to the younger generation. And uh, the evaluation that will be attached to this um, will, will be will give us uh, some insight into what uh, different generations also get out of it. <clears throat> Thank you very okay. much, Chrissy. Wonderful. And uh, now we move on to Virginia. Hi, all. Hi, welcome, bienvenida. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Do you hear me? It's OK? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. So uh, um, you can now introduce okay. your fellowship proposal. Thank you, Paco. I'm, I'm really happy and nervous <laughs> to be here with you, all friends. Uh, we, we need some. Uh, um, we need to be here, to be together. Uh, I really miss uh, to see you in person, but uh, this is quite similar. So thank you very much for uh, OGN to, to let me be here as, uh, as one of the uh, four uh, GoGN research fellow. Um, I'm really happy and honored um, for the ones that don't know me. I'm Virginia Rodez. I'm from Uruguay. Uh, I work in the Universidad de la República in Montevideo. Um, uh, and I'm going to, to work in this uh, GoGM as GoGM uh, Go Research Fellow in the uh, quite a continuous uh, continuity of my PhD research that this was focused on uh, university teachers, but now I'm going to work with the uh, K-12 teachers in the special uh, uh, situation re uh, regarding the, the, the this strange, difficult, uh, hard year that we are uh, living in uh, these uh, pandemic times. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, I, okay. Um, some um, um, presentation about my PhD thesis, uh, uh, that it was a grounded theory on the adoption of open educational resources and repositories in, in Latin American universities. I, I focused on uh, university teachers, and I worked with uh, three uh, countries, in uh, uh, three universities in three countries with 12 teachers that, uh, um, and, and I, I worked with a uh, um, uh, grounded theory, um, also, some bi biographical methods, also uh, digital ethnography, so as to uh, um, know the way teachers uh, uh, develop the creation and use and reuse of digital resources and, and how they can shift to uh, um, to uh, open uh, other questionnaire resources and, and also be connected with open practices and. Uh, I developed a, a, a critical model based on the Latin American perspective on, on OER adoption uh, that is uh, uh, already being published in, in, in some, uh, um, in some uh, papers. Uh, I'm now uh, being published in uh, my, my, my PhD thesis results. So, uh, the the starting point of this um, of this idea, the idea of uh, working with the uh, uh, K twelve teachers, uh, uh, as you know, I I I I'm work I work in in, in university, and, and my focus was also always uh, working uh, in teacher education and and training of uh, university teachers so as to develop uh, 
mostly online and open learning. But uh, I had the opportunity to work with my, with my friend and partner in the OER Center that we, we developed in uh, uh, the Universidad de la República uh, in, a, in an invitation that uh, the Centro Sefore of uh, Poland uh, made us to collaborate in a, public, in a publication that is going to be presented uh, um, on uh, on October uh, in the Open Education Policy Forum, um, that is was uh, uh, focused on the the way uh, the role of open education uh, uh, um, take play took place in overcoming the educational crisis during the the, the COVID nineteen pandemic in the case of Uruguay, and really was. Uh, uh, um, astonishing for me the way uh, open education uh, uh, was uh, uh, um, I think it was a shift in the adoption of open education mostly uh, in the case of uh, of uh, k-12 teachers we developed uh, a research uh, um, I think it was perhaps Ada can remember me but I think it was uh, four years ago uh, to to um, it was a survey to to collect the uh, uh, um, ideas about uh, open um, open educational resources and open publishing by by K twelve teachers. But in, and we find that were uh, some um, um, interest to and 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 and, 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 and some feelings uh, uh, possible positive feelings to uh, develop their practices uh, more open. But it, uh, we saw that uh, the, 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 great, the great online and the, the, the shift to digital practices that were uh, um, um, that the pandemic uh, caused uh, in a really different uh, way this year. And when uh, all the uh, activities ha um, started to be in, in a digital way, uh, where a shift to, uh, to adopt uh, open educational resources that uh, uh, in the case of uh, the Uruguayan uh, system were uh, just being uh, offered for teachers uh, uh, also plat educational platforms in uh, um, developed by the state and uh, we saw that uh, the uh, really increase of the use of the open educational uh, resources repositories and uh, in, in this publication we 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 um, we share some findings about this increase and some metrics and also uh, we uh, conducted uh, two interviews with uh, uh, directors of school directors uh, i don't know is is this the, the term of head teachers i don't know what uh, is the the um, the best uh, term in in english to to, to in relation to the, the, the teacher that is uh, that direct the the the, um, the education in a school, and uh, we we found some findings that uh, show uh, um, a really increased adoption and uh, wonderful practices uh, of creation and reusing. So uh, with Patricia, we started to think about. Uh, as the way to continue this uh, this study uh, in a more qualitative way, so as to uh, um, to to see a more, in a in a more in a deeper uh, way uh, what were really happening. Uh, this is also um, um, I was working with Leo uh, yesterday and on Monday in a, in the workshop that we were. Uh, Developing with the Centro uh, Sefore to uh, to um, critic to criticize the publication before it is going to be presented. And some of the things I I, I, I highlighted that is is that uh, the shine the the, the the shiny part of this that is is uh, is uh, the the increase of the uh, adoption and. And, and, and some of uh, wonderful uh, uh, no, news for open education can hide the, the difficulties, the, the hard times that teachers are being uh, 
living during this uh, year and uh, uh, the, 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 um, how can open education uh, lead uh, uh, critical views in order to uh, see the, the whole picture, not only the shiny uh, way, the shiny side. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you understand me, but this is, uh, I think it's necessary to, to contextualize more deeply the, these experiences uh, in, the, in, in, in relation to the, the, the system, uh, the educational system that, that is, uh, is situated, the, the, live, the lives of the teachers uh, uh, and how did, uh, uh, they manage the, the uh, combination with, the, with a, a home, uh, homework and uh, care uh, activities and also the, the, the way they uh, um, develop their uh, teaching practices, uh, but also the the the, the um, uh, I think uh, one of the the most important thing I saw in in the first interviews, uh, and the and, and we, I, I also uh, uh, con conducted two more interviews uh, during uh, uh, before the, this study, so as to. Uh, be sure that uh, what we saw in the first uh, uh, interviews uh, were uh, in, in uh, were uh, were uh, correct. Uh, that um, there is a huge amount of creation activities that can be uh, shifted to open educational resources, not only reuse. And how this ca this view can uh, in in some way uh, uh, change the way we the uh, open educational resources, not only a reusing crea uh, activity, but mostly a, crea a creation activity. So um, the idea is to uh, deepen in findings, uh, interview with teachers, more teachers, not only the directors, but all, also I, I, I have already uh, uh, conducted two uh, group interviews with teachers um, we were asking us so if we can uh, add more uh, cases more schools uh, um, I'm sure that uh, we are going to in, uh, include another school and perhaps another one so perhaps can be four school and uh, I'm going to um, to use uh, uh, the same uh, PhD thesis methods, the ground theory, uh, biographical methods, and also digital ethnography to develop this. And uh, the, um, in the in the interviews, I, I also introduced some of the of the uh, uh, research questions and also the 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 the, in the instruments uh, of the, of my PhD thesis, so as to also. Uh, um, can be compared with the uh, uh, findings in university teachers, so it could be a, a more uh, uh, um, could be another study uh, this comparison. So um, further study. So uh, these uh, these interviews are going to be more deep, uh, more um, um, focused on the integration into practice and how much. Uh, where we are iterating teaching plans and practices of distance education caused by the pandemic, uh, how we are integration into teaching practices uh, were, uh, what do uh, you use it for, how do you integrate into teaching, uh, how do teachers know how to differentiate between OER and other types of content because uh, they, they, they say that they, they use a, a they, they use uh, the, the repositories of, uh, of the uh, education assistant provide, but also other uh, that they found in the internet. Uh, so I we I want to 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 uh, um, to deepen in this uh, in, in this difference and, and, and how they are aware about OER and what are the most common creation and reuse practices. And also regarding perceptions and attitudes and regarding the, all, all the, how the pandemic changed their perspective of open, uh, about open education, if they, they change, if, if, if there is a change or 
perhaps it's, uh, um, they, they were aware about uh, open education, uh, what the lessons have been learned, uh, which changes do we now need to improve access uh, to, uh, in, in education and educational continuity, how this, uh, this, the open education uh, were a part of this, uh, um, this uh, improving of, of access and educational continuity. And also, what kind of recommendations, suggestions, or reflections can be developed, uh, um, uh, become a policy uh, um, for, based on these experiences? So, um, this Gaudian field, research fellow, is going is aimed to investigate the experiences of our teachers from public primary schools in Uruguay in relation to the creation, use, and reuse of OER and, and national repositories during the, the COVID-19 COVID, uh, emergency, identifying in the drivers uh, that led in, to an increase of the adoption in this particular scenario and based in ground theory. Uh, The, the products of uh, the results and, and, and the, the products uh, I, I, I'm going to develop uh, for this uh, research fellowship uh, are a, a research paper. Uh, I hope uh, we can uh, have uh, this uh, created uh, until March. And uh, also dissemination activities. I think uh, all the blog post in in the GoGN webpage, but also I, I think uh, it could be interesting to develop some uh, webinars with uh, the um, uh, national education administration uh, and perhaps with the uh, uh, teacher education council uh, and so as to uh, spread and also to collect the uh, the um, to collect uh, <laughs> it's my 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 daughter uh, to collect the findings okay uh, and uh, the way they they see the this publication well um, thank you uh, I want to to find some comments uh, by my dear friends of Gojian. Thank you very much, Virginia. It's time now for some questions. I think indeed, uh, Chrissy was asking, what do you speculate you will find? Sorry? Chrissy was asking, what do you speculate you will find? Uh, uh, I'm I already find that uh, creation is a uh, is a very important uh, issue regarding OER. Uh, when I asked uh, the, the teachers uh, in this in, in in those interviews that uh, I were uh, doing before the the the, the central Florida study, uh, I found that they say that uh, it's a half and half. And they are very proud about creation. So, can we uh, connect creation with uh, all the OER uh, um, um, uh, literature and studies that are focused on reusing? I think the, uh, it's, 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 uh, for teachers, the, uh, the creation activity is one of the most important things. And they are proud about creation. So. I have. I, I think that is uh, one of the findings. Uh, that, uh, is 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 this? Uh, most. I also think that uh, another uh, important thing uh, were uh, that um, uh, teachers are reusing uh, the the institutional. Uh, that, that I think that the the one of the drivers are the need. They are starting to use these resources because they need it. And, and how uh, can we learn? Uh, uh, what can we learn about this? About the the the, the need 
of something to be adopted. Um, uh, another another thing I think it's important uh, is uh, um, in relation to uh, the uh, the way they they use uh, they adopted open education so as to uh, deal with uh, the pandemic and which are the the uh, collaborative practices of creation and reusing and also the uh, collaborative practice uh, of sharing between teachers, between schools, not only by, re by repositories. They are, uh, I found that they are sharing practices that are very important and have, be, have to be highlighted. Uh, we often hear about that uh, open education is about uh, uh, sharing by in, uh, in repositories, but there are a lot of sharing practices that have to be highlighted and uh, connected with open education practices. So I think this is uh, some uh, of uh, the findings I I I am mm, speculating to 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 collect. That's great. Thank you very much, Virginia. I think one of the comments more uh, we can find more often is that very very needed research, the one you are proposing. So uh, congratulations, and well, uh, what time is it now in uh, Uruguay? Thank you very much. What time uh, is now? Now it's uh, about 9.30, I think. In the morning, so... Yes, 9.30, <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> Great. The house is starting <laughs> to move. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, thank you very much for all to attending this uh, uh, the session. Thank uh, you for all. And uh, now uh, we are going to have uh, a break of uh, 25 minutes.